gentlemen. Hope you had a good lunch. I don't want to spoil it by saying you shouldn't buy royalty in streaming companies, but uh, I think they're not a bad place to be, but I think their time is over. The capital markets are starting to open up for uh, stories slowly, but um, in a strong market for metals, the, uh, the royalty and streaming companies have lost their competitive edge. Not to say they won't deliver profits, they'll just underperform the market. Um, I just want to show you, this sector is moving. This is, um, it, since 2003, uh, this is looking at performance of uh, six juniors. One just got taken out. But you can see the percentage gain on the left-hand side, um, up over 2,000% for Great Bear, the highest. The others are lumped in somewhere between uh, about up 300% to up 800% in the last three years. These are all small, started out as small stocks, not much liquidity, um, not large followings, but exploration stories and development stories carried them on. In the last eight months, you could again look at the left-hand side and see the growth in share price up over 100% for 2G gold fields, and down at the bottom, GT Gold at about 40% in the last 18 months. This is a sector that's hot, it's alive, um, and it's moving along. Now, these companies are often prey to streaming companies and royalty companies. And the managements of the companies, in my mind, have to be very careful not to listen to the siren call of, easy money and it's not going to take much away from you. So this is looking from 2016 forward and share performance. And I have to say that being in a royalty or a streaming company was a good place to be from about 2012 till recently um, because they were taking the profit margins out of these juniors. But you can look at Sandstorm, it's a streaming company, it's up 100 and, almost 120% since January of 16. Uh, Franco Nevada, it's interesting, it's, it's the same as the GDX in the last three years. But you can see Franco's in red, if we go right back to the left hand side of the screen, in 16 you can see the outperformance of a, of a single company as opposed to uh, an ETF. Here we get again from 2016. This is um, created an index of eight royalty companies, streaming companies, and compared it to the GDX, and the GDX being a reflection of the senior producers. You can see a difference of 26% in terms of performance. Uh, again, highlighting what has been taken out of the industry. Now here, I want to show a royalty company against what was the largest gold company in the world up until very recently, Barrick Gold, going from 2016 forward. And you can see Franco Nevada's in dark blue and Barrick in a gold color. The beginning of, or through 16, it really outperformed the royalty companies. Then we went into a falling gold market and bad, I think we had some recoveries. But right now, Barrick and Franco Nevada are at an intersection. And I'm going to suggest to you that Barrick, once the gold market starts to move, is going to perform much better than Franco Nevada, much better than any other royal company or streaming company. And that's the end of my case. I think these are um, management is weak that uses, that sells streams and royalties, they give away the profit margin, they give away the reason why investors are buying gold stocks. They're buying gold stocks because they believe they're going higher. By utilizing these instruments, they're sacrificing their upside, sacrificing the potential they offer investors. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, my name is Joseph Delaplan. I'm Vice President of Corporate Development for Cisco Gold Royalties. Um, 
maybe just a quick word on Cisco before I launch into the case for royalties. Cisco is one of the newest royalty companies out there. Uh, we formed this company after having uh, built and sold Canadian Malartic and in that transaction, each one of our shareholders kept a share in Cisco World Royalties, which owns a 5% NSR on that mine, which is a great royalty and has supported our company um, you know, over the last five years. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is perhaps share uh, some of my key observations uh, being in a royalty company over the last five years, uh, as I think there's some, some interesting things to take away from that experience. One of the things that we underestimated when we started this company, uh, and, and you, you know, a lot of you know Sean, he's a very energetic guy. We closed our deal with Ignico and Yamana and, and the next day signed a CA and we're off meeting companies and putting term sheets to, uh, to CEOs on, for royalty financing. Um, and it was quite interesting to see how strongly people feel or CEOs feel uh, versus royalties and streams. A lot of them feel very negatively about them. And so, you know, that was, that was quite surprising for us. And, you know, if we were going to build a business, we had to understand why and how, you know, what we were going to do about it. Um, so when you look at it, the royalties as an asset class have materially outperformed the rest of the mining sector over the past few decades and have generally traded at premium multiples to gold producers. In fact, you know, we've run the numbers many different ways. It's hard to find a period of time over which royalty companies have not outperformed most gold equities. Um, same thing on, the, on a multiple basis. These are price to NAV multiples over time with the royalty companies being in blue. Uh, it's, you know, generally royalty companies have traded at premiums to the gold producers. So, I mean, this is, this is great. It's, it's been a great place for investors to put their money. Um, but we're living with that legacy as well. When we started this company, we're, we're being launched into, uh, into a sector where you show up to most conferences with you know, the larger, largest royalty companies showing their share performance chart being a 90 degree angle uh, vertical. So it's a you know, very successful business, but also that success is now becoming a hurdle uh, to, to the industry and we have to do something about it. The other interesting fact is that the amount of capital allocated to the royalty, royalty sector has substantially grown over the last 15 years. Um, this is an interesting chart. It shows the aggregate market cap of all the royalty companies since 2004. And you know, over this period of time, some companies have been bought and sold, but the number of companies has gone from nine to 16. And in 2004, it was a $2 billion total market capitalization, and now a $35 billion market capitalization in total. So that's a huge amount of capital that's now gone into that space. And what, it, what this tells us is that shareholders are increasingly trusting royalty companies to allocate capital to the mining sector. It's an other important point to, to, uh, to note. The other important thing is that royalties and streams themselves have significantly evolved over the last 30 years, both in terms of their role, but also in terms of their structure. <clears throat> Until about 2008, most royalty deals were, you know, uh, royalty companies buying prospector royalties or royalties that had been earned through an earn-in structure. Um, and that was the case until about 2007 when IPO Francoed and then really Franco and Silver Wheaton led the charge in terms of creating new financing royalties, new financing structures. They created precious metal streams. And since then, the role of royalty and streaming has substantially changed and it's really taken a much bigger financing role <coughs> in the space. Um, and now, you know, you, you see royalty deals as part of M&A, you see royalty deals to restructure uh, balance sheets. Um, so it, today, they, it plays a quite, you know, vast role in the space. And if you look previously, there was a very low level of competition. And today, there's a very high level of competition in the space. And that's generated better pricing for the, for the companies. Um, and in terms of the contracts themselves, you know, if uh, a royalty contract dating from pre-2000 typically were one page. Today, our typical royalty contract is 75 pages and streaming contracts are 150 pages. So they've become really complex agreements that, you know, both parties can protect themselves. Um, and so as, overall, it's just become a much more sophisticated instrument. And royalties today can play a much bigger role in the capital structure for, 
for companies. The other thing that's important to know is that royalties and streams are actually the most flexible types of financing agreements. Um, really, you can, do, you can structure anything you want into a royalty or a stream. Um, and it, you know, today we're seeing deals that are highly structured, and these are just some of the features we've seen in some recent transactions. Um, you see royalties being sold to fund exploration, to fund studies, to fund construction royalties that are milestone based with a portion of the capital coming pre-construction and some of the capital coming during construction. You see royalties that have caps, royalties that have buybacks or buy down provisions, royalties that have tails. So this is when, you know, after you hit a certain number of ounces delivered on the con under the contract, the percentage decreases and so the company can retain more upside. Um, you see features where if there's an expansion at the mine, the royalty holder has to pay for, the, for part of that expansion. Um, commodity price adjusters, you know, some are secured, some are unsecured. So really it's a blank canvas. And within that, uh, there, in my experience, there's always um, a good deal to be had for the company where it can be tailored to their specific situation. It, that's important to know. Um, the most important thing is actually the cost of capital that it provides to the company. And, you know, the, the reason why is when you compare how equity deals are priced versus how royalty deals are priced, most equity deals are priced based on the current share price. And typically, you know, an equity transaction will be, will be done at a, um, a discount to the last trade. And then you also have to pay commission, uh, broker commissions. So you're looking at an all in discount of 15 to 20%. Royalty deals are priced on an IRR basis on a discounted cash flow model. And so right off the bat, no commissions, no fees, um, and you're, you're going to achieve multiples much closer to NAV than you would in an equity transaction. And if you look at, at recent deals, you know, I've listed some of the recent royalty and streaming deals for companies below one and a half billion. Um, you see average PNAV uh, achieved in those deals of 0.75, average IRR of about 11%. If you include all of the royalty transactions, actually these numbers would be much lower. Uh, if you include some, include some of the bigger deals being done by Franco. Um, and these are the numbers for recent private placement issuance. So 0.48 PNAV multiple, you know, at the time of issuance and add on top of that an all-in discount of about 15%. So clearly you can achieve you know, really good pricing um, in a royalty financing. Um, and I think fundamentally from, from our point of view, it's about financial partnership. The way we've structured our business, you know, we understand all these dynamics. We understand that we have to be a partner to the companies that we finance. Uh, Cisco's perhaps taken a unique approach in this sense in that we've most often taking a cornerstone shareholding in the companies that we invest in, that we provide royalty capital to. We've led all if, uh, you know, all if not most of all the financings that our companies have done, most of all the equity financings. And we've tried to share our ex technical expertise um, and, and share some costs uh, with our associate companies to really help them and really make these projects strong. Um, so, you know, as a conclusion, what I'd say is, Royalty companies have been a great investment. Um, royalties have evolved quite a lot in the last 20 years. They can now play a very important role in a company's capital structure. And uh, the decision to sell a, a royalty should hinge around cost of capital considerations and choosing the right financial partner. Thank, thank both of you. Um, <clears throat> I have a, uh, a very biased uh, uh, direction towards the royalty companies because my first deal ever as a young banker was Franco Nevada. Um, and, uh, and seeing how they grew and what it was, and I think what I've discovered really for, for this, this space is that the royalty companies, most of their shareholders are actually not gold funds. And most of the analysts do not cover them. Um, it's just predominantly, I guess, uh, Cosmo uh, covers them in an extensive way, but that's for the financial institutions. Uh, and they look at them because of their ratios. I mentioned earlier revenue per employee. They also look at the volatility of the cash flow of Franco Nevada is substantially less than Newmont and Barrick. Uh, if you, when you carve out the, their assets in Nevada, um, they're, they're 
their volatility is much less, and that's a big factor now for portfolios. Um, so when they did a billion dollar financing, they, I think 350 million came through Citadel, who then went through financial institutions. Um, so I think that it's another form of capital. So that's to recognize, I, I, uh, and I do see that we've had some also, also uh, Elliott Management, um, they've created their own sort of limited partnership in this space. So I think it's a, another, for me, just a simple, another clean financing mechanism. Uh, especially royalty companies, you know, Rob, they only can do well when it's a bear market. That's, so they are, but they're a source of capital when the brokers and banks aren't. So it actually tries to help the, the, the space. Um, and, and I still really interested, why do you think they're really so bad for the industry? Because I had a portfolio of a bunch of juniors that had royalties uh, on them, and they actually did quite well. Kirk and Lake was one of the best performing gold stocks in the past three years. Uh, they had a royalty. Um, it, it was a form for them to, to grow with. Kirkland and Lake did well because they discovered Fosterville and Macasso South. But they need capital. They needed capital, but I think they, management should be looking further afield. They're giving up a large part of their profit margin, assuming no discovery. And most deposits continue well past the life of when someone's doing an NAV. So it's, it's something that lingers there for the life of the project. Um, I think, as Joseph said, the, all the features, the way they're now trying to customize their offerings is acknowledgement that, one, it's a, crowd, a more crowded field of royalty companies there competing, and two, that the capital markets have come alive again and are providing capital, so they have to be offering more attractive terms. But for the, most of the companies, they may have built, and I, I'm not saying they haven't been bad investments, I just think it's a bad decision for management to sell royalties, and particularly if knowing that we're in a cyclical business and when we go into downturns, all the profit margin is largely going to the royalty companies. As your costs are falling, you're, you're taking it right off the top. And it's forever, usually. But now it's changing. <laughs> but um, to me, it's very akin to hedging. And when I was running Gold Corp, I refused to hedge. So, But a 2% royalty is what, 25% of gross margin? Uh, it, it depends on the, the price and your cost on, structure. On average, isn't that what it is? Two points is usually 25%. It could be. And so if there's no capital around, then what do you do? Don't build. Wait. You know you're in a cyclical business. The metal prices are going to come back. Wait. We had a silver project in Mexico that got fully permitted in 2015. Silver price was below $15. Our share price was scraping along the bottom. It said, look, we don't have to build this right now. We'll wait until the silver price returns to a higher level and when our share price is hopefully higher and we can finance cheaper and the economics on that project are going to be greater. And, and I just think there's so many people have rushed to build. We've overbuilt. We've gone over budget on most of our projects in, in the industry and we've delivered unsatisfactory returns. And that's why people aren't looking at this industry. The broad market isn't looking at it because we haven't delivered the returns. And as you were talking about volatility, and yesterday you were talking about volatility, the digital currencies, cryptocurrencies, have much greater volatility than the gold stocks right now. Absolutely. And so we're moving into a period, hopefully, where we have greater volatility in the gold price, and the royalty companies have lower vol than the producers, the individual companies. So that's all I'm making a statement is we're at a transition point, an inflection point in the market. And if you had, we're lucky enough to have a royalty company investment for the last five years and you're looking for better return, you should be looking for the individual producers that are not subject. And it's even better if they're not subject to a royalty or a stream. We have a project in uh, Timmins that we bought. It came with a stream. And I'm doing my utmost effort to be exploring on parts of the property without a stream and bring that into production faster than expanding what we're doing where there is a stream because 8% of our revenue is being taken. Um, so the stream is 8%? Yes. And the, 
there were two, owner, two owners before us, they'd put a 12% stream on it, which is sort of suicidal. Uh, they bought back four, but they're still 8%. But I don't think uh, Wheaton Resources and Frank, are you getting 8% royalties, streams? No, I mean, our, our base world is a 5% NSR. Uh, and streams are slightly different because they, they do have an ongoing component that they pay to the operator. Some do, some don't. Some do, some don't, uh, depending on how they're structured. I mean, truly, I, I sort of agree in a sense that no company should do a bad deal. Um, you should always benefit from these transactions in terms of getting capital into the company, ideally getting a long-term financial partner that's going to step up you know, more than just once. Um, and again, going back to my initial comments, you know, we have legacy royalties and streams in our business and we've seen examples of terrible royalty deals. We've seen examples of great royalty deals. Um, and I think the industry as a whole is getting more aware of these transactions, getting more sophisticated and structuring them in a way that's helpful to the companies and to their shareholders. And I mean, like I take two examples just on your, on your first question. Take Canadian Malartic as an example. I'm sorry, I can't hear you talk to <clears throat> Take Canadian Malartic as an example. We have a 5% NSR on Canadian Malartic, which is, by all respects, a large royalty. Um, that delivers about $80 an ounce to us. Uh, and the cost profile of that mine is such that they're all in sustaining costs right now is about 620 including the royalty. So well-structured deal, the asset can easily hold that royalty. Um, this was a unique setting for creating this this royalty, but but goes to show nonetheless that it, you know if done well it can work. Um, another good example would be the deal that we did with Arizona Mining. So Arizona Mining 2016, they didn't have any capital, they didn't have access to capital, they needed to buy this important property that they thought had a big deposit on it. Uh, we provided $15 million, $5 million in equity, $10 million in the format of a, of a 1% NSR royalty. And most of us know the, the history after that. Two years later, they sold the company for almost $2 billion to South 32. Um, so it was important to them because they had no other capital available to them. They could have waited, uh, but they, they didn't, and it worked in their favor. Um, so I think, you know, again, they have to be smart deals. You can't overburden these assets. Uh, the, the margins have to be healthy uh, after, after you layer on these instruments. But where I think the industry is today, I think that's well understood and we can structure, we can structure these instruments so that they work for the shareholders. Sean, uh, Pierre, uh, Randy, um, uh, they all believe that when they put a royalty on an asset that they're helping that junior mining as a good housekeeping seal because they have their whole technical team before they go ahead and deploy that capital, take the risk with that money, uh, that this is a long-term sustainable relationship. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, and that's one of the things that we tell our shareholders all the time, right? Because especially with our business where we do have a big portfolio of equities, um, when we talk to, to shareholders, what we say is we spend on average $200,000, $250,000 doing due diligence on each opportunity that we look at, you know, look at seriously, right? So when you're investing in a Cisco, you know that we've done that work. Um, we've looked at the data. We have a big technical team in-house um, that, you know, it's the same guys that look at every single opportunity. We don't use outside consultants. And... That comes from, you know, you know, Sean, that Sean is a technical guy. He, he really believes in the value of having that team in house. And that is something that we try and share as much as possible with the companies that we invest in. And almost every single one of our investments, we have members of our team, either on the board or within the management team or on the technical team, um, helping, collaborating, uh, sharing ideas, sharing that expertise. And you know, classic example of that, Victoria Gold. So this is, this is a project that was permitted, um, you know, had basically been sitting there for a very long time. And um, we partnered with Orion to, to fully finance that construction and a big selling feature for, for our capital in that transaction was the fact that we would be helping the company out from a technical point of view. So yeah, I, I really do believe in that. Uh, Rob, when you've had to go out and talk to the Francos, et cetera, 
um, sort of get reconnaissance or you don't even talk to them. Just try to get an idea what, if they wanted a royalty in this asset, what would they charge? How much capital would you get? Do you explore that with them? Haven't talked to them. It's I not see. part of my thought process. I'm looking to try to maximize the upside. I don't want to cap it. And I, I throw royalty streams, hedges all into the same basket, limiting the upside. Uh, maybe in time, as capital markets come back and the royalty companies have to fight harder for business, um, take a look at it. But to me, they're the pariah of the industry. They're not a bad place to put your money. Um, they'll give you a good return. Um, but it's not where I want to put my money. Um, I, d I have to say I do have an interest in one royalty company, but being run by a, a fellow who worked for me. But small one. It's done quite well. The, um, my, my experience has been, I know I did just you show Grand Columbia up there and uh, they went to do a royalty. And they went out and they explored with different companies to get different opinions of, and they found the exercise really useful uh, to figure out what does that cost, what's the value. And they end up doing their own gold note, uh, which is listed on the stock exchange. And, uh, and that cost them eight and a quarter percent coupon. Uh, but it's defined that it's paid off over seven, eight years, but it's still an attractive piece of paper. That's what they had to do. But their cost of capital, they still had to go and pay GMPs of the world, you know, 6% commission on top of that. So that was costly capital, but it was still cheaper than the royalty company, which would have an infinity on, on those assets. So that was their, their trade-off uh, for that to help them expand their capital. Um, but the exercise was they went and spoke to them and try to better understand. Come up with a cost of capital comparison. And, and w when, what were the reasons for the differences? Um, and so do you look at and analyze when the announcements made that Sandstorm has done a transaction or Franco, uh, do you guys dig in deeply to try to understand what they offered for competitive? Absolutely, I mean, this is, this is our game. We uh, keep a pretty detailed list of precedents in terms of returns and multiples paid and structures, because the structures are changing every day too. Um, and we have to continually innovate and find a, dif a way to differentiate ourselves. Um, and you know, interestingly enough, the, the returns have sort of gone from being expensive to really cheap money and they're, they're coming back a bit in my, you know, in my view, uh, we've seen companies deploy capital at, you know, the royalty companies deploy at less than 4% IRR in some cases. Um, and so some of those deals have worked really well. Some of them have been disasters. And so I think the royalty industry is also kind of figuring itself out, you know, what the, what the return should be for, you know, specific types of risk. And that's something that we track for sure. How small will you go for a deal? Um, unfortunately, I, I do more $200,000 deals than I care to do, but our business is really uh, full spectrum. So we've, we look at really small transactions up to, you know, our ideal check size is 100 million, but we've done bigger deals as well. So you're doing small, small micro cap deals? Yeah, because I mean... Because the Franco's not. Franco's not doing that, That's not really... Well, they, they've actually done some this year. They, they made some investments that surprisingly were fairly small for Franco. Uh, but that's not really their business and it doesn't have that big of an impact for them. Um, one of our strategies is we look at camps, camps that we like, and we try and grab royalties when they become available. And we try to find royalty holders and buy, buy their royalties. So sometimes that means you're going to pay 15 million for it. Sometimes you're going to pay 100,000 for it. But we really think of our business in terms of real estate and we're trying to get royalties on the best real estate. I think, you know, if you look at royalty companies, it's going to depend on your risk profile and you have a, a fairly safe investment there, a largely diversified portfolio and an income stream that's not subject to environmental or management unless the mine shuts down or closes. You've, you've got a stream without the headaches that are attendant to one individual company. But for that security, you're sacrificing upside. And that's why. And it depends on the, where you are in the cycle. And I believe we're in the second half of the bull run in this market and you want to be long producers, explorers, individual stories, not royalties. 
how, how many deals do you see? Um, a very large amount, especially right now. Um, you know, we probably get about 10 inbounds a week on 10 inbounds a week, a week. Yeah. And how many deals are coming looking for capital from you? Rob? We keep the door open. I, I won't say we'll get 10 a week. I don't want to take 10, but I always want That's to. a lot of time. Yes. It, you just want to use it as a listening post for what's going on in the market. And maybe you can identify some candidates that might become farm team material that will fuel future growth. So always looking. And where do you see the growth for a Cisco in the royalty business? So we've taken a different approach to the royalty space um, with what we call our accelerator business. Um, you know, one of the things that we didn't like when we started this company is, is to be dependent on investment bankers bringing us transactions in areas and places that we don't care to invest. Um, so what we've, what we've done is we've tried to find projects that we like and, you know, build up those companies and become financial partner to those companies. So really a lot of the growth in our company will come from that business. And what we aim to do is position ourselves three, three to five years when there's two or three good minds being built in Canada that we're the lead financial partner on half of them and, and participate in project financing that way. Um, so that's, you know, that's where we see the future of our business. And of course, we look at transactions every day. If there's a producing royalty that comes our way, we will, uh, we'll look at it. We'll, we'll most likely bid on it. But because we have this organic pipeline that we've created for ourselves, we can be a little more disciplined about returns uh, when we invest. Rob, one recent thing is not in the gold business, in the REIT business. And uh, talk about the conflicts. Um, the banks, the big banks, um, will call up if uh, GMP is doing a big deal, but they have the loan that they'll call the loan uh, if the deal's not being, the equity raised is not being done through them. Uh, and so that does a starve capital uh, for growth. And so now all of a sudden, those deals that grew from small to big deals for the GMPs of the world, mm -hmm. miss many of the sort of independent brokers, um, they're being squeezed out by the big banks. So the same thing, I'm sure, on, on the bigger mining deals, if it's a debt funding, uh, that if, they, if you have to borrow from TD or you borrow from Royal Bank or whatever, that they basically have to take care of all of your equity funding. Do you think that that's more costly than a royalty, a normal royalty deal with, with a Cisco or a Franco if, if I'm like raising capital? I don't have a frame of reference log large enough to make a comment on that. Uh, but I would agree with you that you're seeing a consolidation of the brokerage industry. You're seeing a consolidation focusing more into the large institutions and it's going to deny capital to the smaller stories because they just won't allow them in their portfolios. Um, maybe we'll see exchanges appear on the internet that sort of go beyond the, uh, the recognized exchanges. You have about plus 40 exchanges here in the country. When I started in the investment industry, you really had New York and you had the Amex and a couple of others, but now there's a huge number that institutional people can get onto and also any internet trader. So maybe we're going to find the mining companies start seeking these other exchanges where you can raise capital and maybe get around some of the securities laws that we have existing as well. Maybe there's, I mean, a, a royalty is a derivative, in a sense, of sure. the mining industry. Uh, so if you see they're, they're making so much money, Rob, why don't you do it? Why don't you, if you're for your shareholders, if it's such easy money for the royalty companies, and you've got deal flow, and deal flow is very valuable, why don't you turn around and say, look, I'm going to give you a million dollars, but I want back a royalty and some shares of your investment. Um, I don't want to drill your property, you have to do that. Because they're making this, all this amount of money, and you're a smart guy, why wouldn't you do that for all these juniors? I wasn't that smart. I no, you're a very didn't smart do guy. That. I so. bet on you, I'm a shareholder, so no, always bet on you. Well, why wouldn't you just you know, emulate that? I tried a different approach when I left Gold Corp. I, would, I may have said it yesterday, but I'd buy 
10 to 30% of a company. And one of the first questions I ask is, do you have a royalty or a stream on your property? Because I'll start throwing them out the door if it's too excessive. I ask how much money they have they invested personally, not how much money has been given to them by free options and that. Um, how committed are they? And then I like the individual stories. I just, but I went in and said, okay, 10 to 30% on a personal basis of the company. I want to buy when they have trouble finding capital because it's more attractive entry point. And I go, I want to first write a refusal on future financings. I want to veto on major acquisitions, divestitures, joint ventures, and I don't want to serve on your board. Um, I didn't want the encumbrances that come with boards. And a lot of these people... Proxy battles, they're just a bitch. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of them, I found a lot of people somehow didn't appear to take math when they were going through school. And you, you, a classic example, and I think the royalty companies prey on that and the streamers, that they're better at math than the guys running a lot of the companies are. But you'd see examples, someone comes along and says, you know, I'd really like to get that major involved in my property. That's going to add credibility. And I'm going to allow them to earn 51% of my property. Let's say it's a small company, has a market cap of, let's say, $50 million. And you're going to allow the major to come in to get 51% for, say, $15 million. And it's conditional. They can back out along the way. And you're going, wait a moment. You're trading at 50. And you're just giving away half the company at 15. That's a market cap of 30. But not a lot of people seem to be thinking about the math when they say, oh, we're going to get the major in, and that's a great thing. And I say, bullshit. There's, there's too many conditional statements in a lot of these deals that a major can walk away within a year, and you just hit the stock again. But I prefer the individual story. And at one point, I'd, I was looking to raise a large fund just before the crash. <laughs> and someone had suggested a royalty. Maybe that would have been a smarter thing to do. <laughs> well, I want to open it up. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? Can you speak a little louder, please? I think an outperformance is coming. Yes, I mean, you, you can look through the cycles. There's been some just phenomenal gains in the past. And I think when the cycle is running, that's when you want to be there. The biggest move in the gold bull markets happens largely in the last year of the bull market. And we're about 45% through what has been some of the longest cycles. And you're moving into the phase where it starts getting interesting. and. In the broad capital markets, the metals are late movers, late cycle movers. So we're in that space now. One of the stocks that showed up there earlier is for Grand Columbia. And three years ago, Grand Columbia had $45 million in accounts payable. They had to restructure their company. Today, they have $50 million surplus, and they've increased their production. But what's interesting is that there's no gold analyst that wrote or newsletter writers recommending them. Uh, no one wants to recommend Serafino. Uh, you know, he's a, an incredible promoter, but people just are always reluctant. But the stock went up 300%. And that was my earlier presentation trying to explain the quants look at that. They're looking at that cash change each quarter, that free cash flow yield, is it expanding or not? And they will start to buy it. And it was trading 1,000 shares a day, not 200,000 now. No analysts. So that's the big part is, is, is that for the royalty companies, it's a lot of quants that come in and they really focus on the income statement uh, and all the different ratios. Uh, you can look it up, uh, Wiki, Investopedia has it, they call it the F factor uh, by a Stanford professor, Prakowski, uh, and he has something like 21 different income statement <clears throat> ratios and analysis that he uses uh, for using for stocks and it's on a Bloomberg function also. So that's what they look at. I think what Rob did in his presentation, which is so important for capturing that audience, et cetera, was showing the CAGR of growth. 
uh, what, what is that revenue growth? What is that reserve growth per share? That's so much more important than your NAV. Uh, in, in sort of capturing the interest for your stock. And the royalty companies, it makes it easier for the data, for them to capture that data, and it makes it easier if they can show revenue last quarter is above four quarters, cash flows last quarter above four quarters, then all of a sudden gold moves up, they're gonna buy those stocks first, unless you get major mining companies showing it. That's the biggest thing I've experienced for both. But I think it is so good to have royalty companies I think it's so good to have uh, 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 opinions like Rob that's out there is, and what the, how they look at the world because it creates a real ecosystem. The capital markets are broken because the minerals are being chased away. And you have to have, to have the ecology, in, uh, looking at an aquarium or in the ocean, the best of life is near the coral reefs it's where there's sharks and there's barracudas and there's tunas and there's groupers. Uh, you, you, you have to have the whole ecosystem. The beach looks beautiful, but there's no life on the beach. So that's what's so important here is that you have this diversity, and it's not just run by five banks in Canada that must load in independent brokers. Uh, that mechanism, I think, that's filled that void has been royalty companies. So I'm happy to see them all. Uh, it just creates more money flows, more money going back and forth, more ideas to be able, uh, still royalty companies make mistakes, they have their problems just like anyone else, but it creates a financial ecosystem. And I wanna thank both of you for helping us out and giving us your opinions and your insight. Um, so we're happy investing, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jeff. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?